Welcome back to the Deep Dive. Today, uh, we're diving deep into the world of reinforcement learning in finance. Oh, yeah. Specifically, we're going to be exploring the idea of the artificial quant. Well, it's amazing to see how this field has evolved, even in just the last few years. You know, what was once a niche area of research is now becoming like a mainstream tool for financial professionals. Absolutely. Yeah. And to guide us on this deep dive, we're turning to the work of Dr. Eves Hilpish and his book, Reinforcement Learning for Finance. This deep dive is also a celebration of sorts. Oh, nice. It's marking the 20th anniversary of Dr. Hilpish's company, the Python Quants. 20 years is a pretty big milestone, yeah. especially in a field as dynamic as quantitative finance. It really speaks to their commitment to innovation and staying ahead of the curve. For sure. Now, this is actually our third episode in this series. So listeners, if you haven't already, go check out the first two episodes for a foundational understanding of reinforcement learning. For today, we'll assume you have that baseline, but let's do a quick recap. The big idea behind reinforcement learning, or RL, is that an agent learns by interacting with its environment and receiving feedback in the form of rewards or penalties. It's very similar to how we humans learn, you know, through trial and error. Right. It's not about like pre-programming specific rules or strategies. Instead, you create an environment, you set up a reward system, and you just kind of let the RL agent loose to explore and learn on its own. And the beauty of RL is that it can discover optimal strategies that humans might never even have thought of. Okay, so that's the basic premise of RL. Now, Dr. Hilpish's book digs into a specific type of RL called Deep Q Learning or DQL, which uses deep neural networks to approximate these optimal strategies. Yeah. Can you unpack that for us a bit? Yeah. What makes DQL so powerful, especially in a financial context? Well, think of DQL as a way to combine the power of deep learning, which excels at pattern recognition, with the decision-making capabilities of reinforcement learning. This makes it incredibly well-suited for tackling complex financial problems where you have tons of data and the need to make strategic decisions in these like uncertain environments. So DQL is like having a super-powered analyst that can crunch massive amounts of data yeah. and then just learn the best course of action, right? I'm curious to hear more about how Dr. Hilpish actually applies this in his book. Well, he doesn't just lay out the theory. He actually walks readers through the implementation of DQL for a range of financial applications. One that stood out to me was his example of building a financial prediction game. Mm. He used this game to train a DQL agent on real historical financial data, which I thought was a really clever way to bridge the gap between theory and practice. A financial prediction game. That sounds pretty intriguing. What kind of insights did he glean from that exercise? One key takeaway was how DQL can challenge traditional assumptions in finance. For example, there's a common assumption that individual actions don't significantly impact the market, especially when it comes to buying or selling stocks. Right. But when you're dealing with large trades, that assumption kind of breaks down. Selling a huge chunk of stock all at once can actually move the market against you. It's called market impact. So it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> yeah. If everyone thinks their actions don't matter, they might act in ways that collectively do impact the market. Exactly. And this is where DQL can be so valuable. It can take market impact into account when figuring out the best way to execute large trades over time, a process known as optimal execution. Okay, so instead of just blindly dumping a huge order into the market, you use DQL to strategically break down the trade into smaller chunks, right? That's the basic idea. It becomes a balancing act. Selling too quickly risks a negative market impact while selling too slowly exposes you to those price fluctuations. Oh, right. The DQL agent learns to navigate this complex landscape, finding the optimal pace and size of trades to minimize costs and risks. It sounds like a perfect example of how DQL can bring a level of sophistication to trading that would be very difficult, if not impossible, for humans to achieve on their own. Absolutely. And Dr. Hilpish explores a specific model for this in his book called the AC99 model, which gets quite technical, but it provides a really interesting framework for thinking about optimal execution in a DQL context. I admit, when I was reading through the book, the AC99 model definitely made my head spin a bit. Yeah. But what I appreciated was that Dr. Hilpish doesn't shy away from these more technical details. He actually provides Python code implementations for many of the concepts he discusses. Yes. I think that's what makes this book so valuable, especially for practitioners. It's not just a theoretical treatise. It's a hands-on guide for actually implementing these techniques. He even delves into the nitty-gritty of data augmentation, which, for our listeners who aren't familiar, is essentially the process of creating new training data from existing data to improve the performance of your AI model. 
Dr. Hilpish talks about using techniques like Monte Carlo simulation to generate synthetic financial data, which I thought was particularly insightful. That's a crucial point. In the world of AI and machine learning data is king. The more high quality data you can feed your models, the better they'll perform. But in finance, getting your hands on large, clean, and relevant data sets can be a real challenge. So techniques like Monte Carlo simulation become essential tools for expanding your training data and making your models more robust. It's almost like giving your AI a much richer and more diverse set of experiences to learn from, right? Instead of just being limited by the historical data you happen to have available. Precisely. And Dr. Hilpish doesn't stop there. He even touches upon the use of generative adversarial networks, or JANs, for creating synthetic financial data, which is a really cutting-edge area of research with huge potential. JANs, those are the things that can create those incredibly realistic deepfakes, right? It's amazing to think they can be applied to something as complex as financial data. It's mind-boggling how fast this field is moving. And what I find particularly exciting is that Dr. Hilpish emphasizes that these techniques aren't just for academics or researchers. He sees them as essential tools for any financial professional who wants to stay ahead of the curve. That's a really important point. This isn't just some futuristic fantasy. It's something that's happening right now, and it's going to have a profound impact on how finance is practiced in the years to come. But with all this talk about AI and algorithms, I'm curious, what about the human element? Is DQL meant to replace financial professionals? That's a question that comes up a lot, and it's one that Dr. Helpish addresses head on in his book. While DQL is a powerful tool, it doesn't mean human expertise is obsolete. In fact, he argues that human judgment is still critical. So it's not about AI taking over. It's about humans and AI working together, right? Exactly. Think of DQL as a powerful tool in the hands of a skilled financial professional. They work together to navigate the complexities of the market, creating what Dr. Hilpish calls the artificial quant. The artificial quant. I love that it perfectly encapsulates the idea that AI can augment human capabilities, mm. but not fully replace them. Mm. So for our listeners out there who are maybe feeling a little intimidated by all this talk about AI and DQL, what would you say are some key takeaways from Dr. Hilpish's book? What's the big picture message here? I think one of the most important takeaways is that reinforcement learning at its core is all about learning from interaction. Mm -hmm. It's a process of trial and error ref refining strategies based on feedback and experience. And while the math can get complex, the underlying principles are actually quite intuitive. You gotta embrace the learning curve. It's a journey, not a destination. Absolutely. And the second key takeaway is that DQL and the neural networks that power it are powerful tools for approximating complex financial strategies. Right. But they're not magic bullets. You need to understand their underlying assumptions, their limitations, and their potential pitfalls. So don't just blindly trust the algorithms. Do your due diligence. Exactly. And finally, remember that human expertise remains essential. AI should augment and enhance human decision making, not replace it entirely. So the artificial quant is this powerful combination of human insight and AI capabilities. Mm -hmm. Now, before we dive even deeper into specific applications in part two of our deep dive, let's take a quick step back and consider the broader context. What's your take on the current state of AI and RL in quantitative finance? Where are we on this journey and what might the future hold? That's a great question, and it's one that I think deserves careful consideration. Well, we're still in the early stages, but the potential is undeniable. Mm. Look at the breakthroughs we've seen in other fields like uh, gaming image recognition, natural language processing. Yeah. It's only a matter of time before we see similar leaps in quantitative finance. So you're saying finance is right for disruption? In a way, yes. But it's not just about disruption, it's about evolution. Okay. Think about how computers revolutionized finance in the past. Mm. Spreadsheets, complex models, high frequency trading, these all transform the industry. AI and RL are like the next logical step in that evolution. So we're not talking about some kind of overnight revolution, but a gradual integration of these powerful technologies into existing systems and workflows. Exactly. And that's where Dr. Hilpish's work is so valuable. He's providing a roadmap, mm -hmm. a practical guide for financial professionals to understand and implement these tools. Right. He's bridging the gap between cutting edge research and real world application. Hmm. Now, thinking about the future, what are some specific areas within finance where you see the biggest potential for RL and AI? One area that stands out is portfolio management. Okay. Imagine AI systems that are constantly monitoring market conditions, analyzing vast amounts of data, and dynamically adjusting portfolios to optimize returns and manage risk. That sounds like the ultimate dream for any investor. 
Hmm. But how realistic is that? It's closer than you might think. We already have robo-advisors that use algorithms to manage portfolios. Right. But RL can take this to a whole new level. By adding that element of learning and adaptation. Meh. Right. Not just following a pre-programmed set of rules. Precisely. And as these systems learn and evolve, they can potentially outperform traditional methods, especially in volatile or unpredictable markets. Okay. That's portfolio management. What else is on your radar? Another promising area is risk management. Okay. AI can analyze complex financial instruments, identify potential risks, and develop strategies for mitigating those risks all in real time. Hmm. This could be a game changer for financial institutions looking to protect themselves from those unexpected losses. That makes a lot of sense, especially in today's interconnected and rapidly changing global markets. And let's not forget fraud detection. Right. AI is already being used to detect fraudulent transactions, but RL can make these systems even more sophisticated, okay. learning new patterns and adapting to evolving tactics used by fraudsters. So it's like an arms race. The good guy is using AI to stay one step ahead of the bad guys. In a way, yes. But it's important to remember that AI is a tool. It can be used for good or for ill. It's up to us as humans to ensure that it's used ethically and responsibly. That's a crucial point. It's not just about the technology itself, but how we choose to use it. Exactly. And that's why books like Dr. Hilpish's are so important. They're not just technical manuals. Yeah. They're starting points for broader conversations about the role of AI in society, the ethical implications, and the potential impact on our lives. And speaking of impact... I'm curious about the potential downsides of AI in finance. Mm -hmm. Are there any risks or concerns we should be aware of? Of course. Just like any powerful tool, AI can be misused or have unintended consequences. One concern is that complex AI models can be like black boxes, mm. making it difficult to understand how they arrive at their decisions. So even if they're making seemingly good decisions, we might not fully understand WHY they're making those decisions. Exactly. And that lack of transparency can make it difficult to trust these systems, especially when it comes to something as important as finance. Mm. That's a valid concern. What about job displacement? Many people worry that AI will automate jobs away, leaving financial professionals out in the cold. What's your take on that? It's a real concern, and it's something we need to address proactively. But history has shown that technological advancements often create new jobs, even as they displace old ones. So it's not just about the number of jobs, but the types of jobs. Precisely. We're likely to see a shift in the skills and expertise needed in the financial industry. Tasks that can be easily automated will likely be taken over by AI freeing up humans to focus on those higher level tasks that require creativity, judgment, and interpersonal skills. So it's about adapting and evolving, not just fearing the inevitable. Yeah. And that's where education and training come in. Absolutely. Books like Dr. Hilpish's are providing valuable resources for individuals to upskill themselves, learn about these new technologies, and prepare for the future of finance. It's about empowering ourselves with knowledge and understanding, not just passively waiting for the AI revolution to happen. Exactly. And this brings us back to the theme of the artificial quant. It's not just about AI replacing humans. It's about humans using AI to become even more effective, more insightful, and ultimately more human. I love that. It's about harnessing the power of AI to enhance our human capabilities, not diminish them. Yeah. Now, before we wrap things up in part three, I want to touch on something that's particularly intriguing to me, the concept of self-learning AI agents. Ah, uh, yes. This is where things get really interesting. Yeah. We're talking about AI systems that can learn from their own experiences, adapt to changing market conditions, and potentially even develop entirely new trading strategies that humans might never have thought of. That's mind-blowing. Because isn't that a bit dangerous, giving AI that much autonomy? It's a double-edged sword, for sure. There's always the potential for unintended consequences for AI systems making decisions that we don't fully understand or agree with. So how do we manage that risk? How do we ensure that these self-learning agents remain aligned with our goals and values? That's one of the biggest challenges in the field of AI. It requires careful design, robust testing, and ongoing monitoring. And it's not just a technical challenge, it's one that requires ongoing dialogue among all stakeholders. We need to be mindful of the potential impact of these technologies and ensure that they're used responsibly and for the benefit of all. So it's not just about building smarter AI, it's about building AI that's aligned with our human values and goals. Exactly. And this is where the conversation needs to go beyond just the technical aspects of AI. We need to engage with philosophers, ethicists, social scientists, everyone who can contribute to this important discussion. Because ultimately, AI is a reflection of ourselves, yeah. of our own values and aspirations. Precisely. And it's up 
to us to shape its development in a way that benefits humanity as a whole. Well said. Now, on that thought-provoking note, well, it's time to wrap up this deep dive into the world of the artificial quant. Yeah, it's been a fascinating conversation. I always enjoy exploring these topics, especially with Dr. Hilpish's book as a guide. Me too. And as we celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Python quants, it's incredible to see how far the field of quantitative finance has come and how much potential it holds for the future. Absolutely. Dr. Hilpish and his team have played a key role in driving that innovation, and this book is a testament to their expertise and vision. Now, before we sign off, I want to leave our listeners with a final thought. Okay, I'm all ears. Throughout this episode, we've discussed the power of DQL, the importance of data, the role of human expertise, but what we haven't explicitly addressed is the question of goals. What are we ultimately trying to achieve with AI and finance? Is it simply about maximizing profits or is there something more? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? And it's one that goes beyond just the realm of finance. What kind of future do we want to create with AI? A future where it's solely focused on financial gain or a future where it helps us address broader societal challenges like uh, sustainability or access to opportunity. That's exactly. AI has the potential to reshape not just the financial industry, but the very fabric of our society. And it's up to all of us to ensure that it's used in a way that benefits everyone, not just a select few. Well said. And that's why I believe that conversations like this one are so important. We need to keep asking these questions, exploring the potential benefits and risks, and working together to shape a future where AI is a force for good in the world. Couldn't agree more. This has been the deep dive exploring the world of the artificial quant with insights from Dr. Eve Silpish. Be sure to check out his book, Reinforcement Learning for Finance, if you want to learn more. And to our listeners, thank you for joining us on this journey. Until next time, happy deep diving.